left off on um, medial thigh. <laughs> Inductors of the thigh, innervated by obturated nerve, as I said before the break. Um, you kind of have to zoom in here. Remember there's a saying my TA gave me to help remember these muscles. Um, not the most politically correct thing to say. Pretty boys like many girls. Pectineus, adductor brevis, adductor longus, adductor magnus, gracilis, from lateral to medial. So here's pectineus. That's not on your study list. There's adductor brevis. There's adductor longus. Dr. Magnus is kind of deep to it. It's hard to see. I'm hi highlighting a sliver of it there. Dr. Magnus and then Gracilis. Now those last three are on your study list. Dr. Longus, Dr. Magnus, and Gracilis. This region, however, is also important because you have major structures um, that serve the anterior thigh, the femoral nerve artery and vein. And let me insert them right here. There's the vein femoral vein, there's the artery, and there's the nerve. From lateral to medial, you have femoral, nerve, artery, and vein in an area called the femoral triangle. The triangle follows the sartorius muscle, and then adductor longus, and then the base of the triangle is the inguinal ligament, okay? So you should know the femoral triangle. Let me, um, well, let me write on the board. It didn't project as well. Triangle is right. One border, one border, one border, like this. Base of the triangle, then this border, then that border, roughly. So the borders are the base of the triangle, inguinal ligament, <clears throat> this medial border, a Dr. Longius, <clears throat> the lateral border, Sartorius. One, two, three. But the contents, the structures are, are what's important. From lateral to medial, from oral nerve, artery, and vein. structures, nerve artery and vein, inside that triangle. This is how things kind of um, squeeze out the front. We talked about the gluteal region, how squeeze, things squeeze out the back, above and below the piriformis. Pretty much how things exit here, if I zoom in on it, they're exiting uh, below the inguinal ligament there. So the inguinal ligament is highlighted in green. And the space below it is called the subinguinal space. So that's this region, a major nerve, artery, and vein coming out the front. Okay, it's a student of anatomy, you need to know that, in addition to the muscles there. So I'm going to clear that out. And clear out the triangle. Let me get back to the muscles. We'll start with the ductor longus. I'm going to isolate it. There's a the ductor longus.
the origin pubis insertion linea aspera so you're originating medially you insert laterally on the back of the femur so basically, you can adduct. I'm not going to write the actions for all the muscles. I'm just going to say they all adduct the thigh. They do other things. And you can look that up, and you can picture in your mind, oh, yeah, I could also probably rotate the hip this way or that way. Oh, yeah, I could probably do this or that. I'm just going to tell you the main action. These all adduct the thigh, and they're all innervated by the opposite <coughs> nerve. So I'm not going to write anything else. Dr. Longus. But Dr. Magnus. You can see it better from posterior. <clears throat> Let me show you the origins of insertions there. That's kind of where it's grabbing the, the hip bone. Pretty much Ischial ramus and inferior ramus of pubis for adductor magnus. Inserts on linea spera, but also adductor tubercle. So all the blue stuff you see are those two things. Linea spera is already on the board. I'll just add to it. Adductor tubercle. If you're following along on the study guide, I also have the adductor hiatus. Do you remember that? I taught it before, I'm not going to teach it again, but let me just show you the hiatus to remind you. <clears throat> That's where the artery goes through. That hiatus, when the femoral artery from the front goes through there, the name changes to popliteal artery. So that space I'm showing you is the adductor hiatus. Okay. Already covered that. Well, let's move on to gracilis. To be graceful, this muscle is named for its nice, slender appearance. It's the medial most muscle. Let me isolate it. It's the inside most muscle right there. Gracilis. Remember when I taught you Tommy John surgery and they had to kind of do a tendon graft? They use this muscle for that. That's one of the muscles that you could select for that. Gracilis, um, I said it's the most medial muscle. Well, um, the origin, you can see there, is basically pubis. And this is the third muscle that will insert via the pes anserinus on the medial aspect of the tibia. Medial aspect, tibia via pes anserinus. Innervated by obturator nerve, adducts the thigh, just like all of them. Um, okay, well, let's see. Let me show you those three muscles. So I'm showing you three muscles. I'm going to zoom in. 
those three muscles are converging on this tendon called the pes anserinus. It doesn't quite look like a goose foot on the app. I've seen it. It looks like a goose foot right here. But those three muscles, um, let me do this. Sergeant foot. This helps me remember this. The three muscles are um, <clears throat> sartorius, gracilis, and the semitendinosus. Bacillus semi tendinosus. The foot is the innervation. The foot is the innervation. So what's the F? Femoral nerve. Femoral nerve. And then the O is obturator. And the T is tibial. Division of the sciatic nerve. Well, anyways, I got that from a student just to help remember the three muscles that use the pes anserinus and their innervation. Okay, the cool thing is you've got three muscles, one from each compartment, all have a different innervation converging on the same tendon, the pes anserinus. Okay. So that's kind of why I want you to know that. <clears throat> I repeat, I got it from a student. I get cool things from students. I'm still waiting for you guys to give me something cool. Give me something cool, come on. Give me COX-6. What? I told you about COX-6. What, what about, I forget. Because you remember you were saying it differently, and I was like, what? Oh, yeah, you, should, yeah, you corrected me. Okay. okay. I guess that counts. You corrected me to say it better. Okay, um, so sergeant foot, uh, medial thigh. Let's see, am I done with medial thigh? I'm done with medial thigh. I'm done with the thigh. Okay, let's move to leg, the region between the knee and the ankle. <laughs> leg. The leg has compartments too. There's a posterior compartment. There's um, there's an anterior compartment. And there's a lateral compartment. There's no medial compartment in muscles. Remember, it's it's what's medial? Look. There's just shin. <laughs> there's no muscles there in that compartment. It's all shin, right? The anterior margin or border. So there is a lateral compartment. Okay, so for this, the joints you have to think about are the knee and the ankle. Ankle, yeah. I'm making sure you're with me. So let's think about the knee. Let's think about the ankle. Pretty much for knee, for posterior, yeah, there's some muscles that cross the knee joint that can help flex it if you're posterior. Now, for anterior and for lateral, I usually don't teach movements of the knee. The anterior compartment, I'm not, te I'm not teaching you any muscles that cross the knee joint anteriorly. So in the anterior compartment, it really has no effect on the knee. The lateral compartment, compartment does. I usually don't teach it because it's not a major action of it. I'm just going to leave it blank. Pretty much, yeah, for that. But for ankle, that's usually the, the joint I focus on for leg muscles. Okay, How they move the ankle and the foot. All right, so, uh, well, okay, let me, let, me, let me do this. There's a rule in anatomy. Rules are good for students to help you understand things.
Okay, I'm showing you basically foot, distal leg, and uh, remember the, the malleolus, lateral or medial malleolus. The rule is if a muscle crosses the malleolus behind it, if the tendon of the muscle, muscle here, but then the tendon, if it passes posterior to the malleolus, that muscle will plantar flex, okay? It will plantar flex. If the tendon passes posterior to the malleolus, the muscle will find our flex the ankle joint, okay? If a muscle passes anterior to it, there's a muscle, so the tendon passes anterior to it. Okay, now it's, you know, there. What will it do? Not plantar flex. Like, you know, um, when we pull the toes up, we call that dorsiflex. So if, a if the tendon of the muscle passes anterior to the malleolus, the muscle will dorsiflex. Okay, so again, pass behind it. Posterior to it, plantar flex, pass in front of it, uh, dorsiflex. That, that's generally what we say here. Um, the muscle we'll talk about in the posterior compartment are the strong plantar flexors. Muscles on the front. Well, can you guess? Dorsiflex. But they also invert the foot. Inversion, I tell you that too, remember? Inversion. In the lateral compartment, um, I'll, uh, you can kind of see it there. Um, they pass behind the malleolus, so they plantar flex. But they evert the foot because they're lateral. Eversion. So anterior compartment, dorsiflex invert, lateral compartment, plantar flex, evert the foot. And the innervation is all different for each compartment. For the posterior compartment, it's tibial nerve. For the anterior compartment, there's a branch of the common fibular nerve. It's um, the deep fibular nerve for this compartment. The lateral compartment, there's a superficial branch of that nerve. Superficial fibular nerve. Go back up to the gluteal region, because that's where the sciatic nerve is. Let me just hide some stuff here. Internal nerves. When you get to the popliteal region, that sciatic nerve splits. Now there's a lot going on here. Let me 
Yeah, kind of busy looking. Let me show you what's going on. Sciatic nerve had two divisions. What color did I use before for the tibial? I can't remember. Was it red? Did I use red? Yeah, I think I used red. Oh, it doesn't matter. Okay, so sciatic nerve is when past by, um, let me draw my landmark, the piriformis. These are two divisions, tibial and common tibular. when they're bound together in the perineria, they're, they're called sciatic. Now when you get to the popliteal region, uh, they, they separate. The two divisions separate. The tibial nerve will remain on the back of the leg. So let's say Lydial region. It's so kind of a triangular shaped region. The side nerve gets there, the tibial nerve will just kind of remain on the back of the leg, go down. The sciatic nerve, the other division, the common fibular, it'll kind of like veer to the lateral aspect of the knee, kind of goes off right here. That's common fibular. Let me highlight it on the app. So what's highlighted in purple is the common fibular nerve going to the lateral aspect of the leg. What's the lateral leg bone? The fibula. And it's called what? The common fibular nerve. So that helps you remember. So I'll just kind of draw this. So when they kind of divide like this, you don't call it sciatic anymore. They, they've divided. You just call it tibial nerve all the way down and common fibula. Now, the word common implies it's going to branch. It's common to a couple of nerves. It's going to, when you get to the fibular head, the common fibular nerve will branch into a deep and superficial branch. Let's see if I can see that right. See a branch right there? Okay, that branch is the superficial fibular nerve, and that branch is the deep branch. It's going to go to the anterior leg. Okay, so you got a deep and superficial. I guess I better use different colors now. Uh, it's going to branch, common fever will branch into, uh, sta uh, it'll stay on the lateral leg. That is the superficial fibular nerve. Okay, that's lateral leg. I'll just say lateral. Remember I just talked about the compartments, that's what I'm referring to. The deep branch. I'll use orange. It'll kind of branch off here and go to the front of the leg. Um, deep fibular nerve. That's for the anterior compartment. Okay, so we got that out of the way. It's kind of the nervous innervation here. There it is sketched out. If you ever see the word peroneal in your studies, it's an older term. Substitute peroneal for fibular, same, same thing. It used to be called the common peroneal nerve. Now it's called common fibular, which I think is better because you already have to know the name of the bone. Okay, well, anyways, that's the nerves. Uh, let me go back to the leg muscles here. Any questions on that, all, all the branches and stuff?
Well, once you study it, it's really not. It's not complicated. It's complicated if we learn more nerves. That, that's just the most basic ones. And we're just doing motor function, right? Because muscles motor function. We're not doing the cutaneous dermatomes. Uh, all right, let's do gastrocnemius. Let's do the posterior compartment. you have the tricep syrup. Remember, the sural region is calf. So tricep syrup means muscles of the calf. Uh, when I was a student, they called this the gastroc soleus complex. Because really, it's three muscles. It's two heads of the gastrocnemius and then soleus, which is deep to it. Two heads are bellies of gastrocnemius. And then one, one more head of the soleus muscle. So altogether, that's three. So triceps sura. Both of these, the gastrocnemius and the soleus, they share a tendon called the Achilles tendon and inserts on the calcaneus bone. I think I taught that to you already. Insert onto calcaneus via calcaneal tendon. Also called the Achilles tendon, neither is fine. I'm going, to use, I'm going to go with calcaneal tendon. That's what I see a little bit more. Well, anyways, what I have highlighted on the app is one head of the gastrocnemius, the lateral head. The reason why I said bellies is because gastro means shaped like a belly, like your actual um, stomach, your belly. Let me isolate it. Okay, let me do a multi-select here. So I'm just showing you gastrocnemius and its tendon. Okay. So let's talk about gastroc and then soleus separately from triceps sura. <coughs> the innervation, tibial nerve. To bring it down, gastrocnemius, the origin. If you look at it, it's originating just superior to the femoral condyles, both heads, both bellies. It's inserting on calcaneus. Its actions, it can move the knee and the ankle. It can flex knee, and it's your strongest plantar flexor, as in jumping.
Okay, let's go back. Let's look at soleus. It's deep to it. There's gas rock. There's soleus right underneath it. So I have soleus highlighted. If I do a fade others, you can kind of see how it's underneath the gas rock. But let's isolate it. There it is. Okay. The origin is basically posterior aspect of tip fib. Inserts on the same place via the same tendon. If you start on tip fib, can you move the knee? You start on tip fib, that is the leg, so you can't move the knee. So it cannot flex the knee. Gastroc can, not soleus, but it does help in the plantar flexion. Okay, so I'll just leave that for an action. The innervation is the same. That's the only muscle back there I want you to know. Cat, your calf muscle. The gastroc soleus complex, you can call it triceps. Sir, do know the heads though. Okay, know the heads. I'm gonna move on to the anterior. That's for soleus, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I should have put soleus somewhere, huh? Good catch. Good catch because when you catch a fish, fillet a sole, that's how the muscle got his name. It looks like a fillet <coughs> of sole. So the name for its appearance looks like a fish. I don't know. Fillet a fish. And before I forget it, when I was on break, I forgot, oh yeah, I forgot that muscle. So I'm gonna deviate from leg and go back up and do tensor fasciae See, I told you to do Ah, forgot. Are you waiting for that? This one here? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. If you're looking for it on your study list, test of fasciolata, I listed it under the gluteal region. So a little uh, off track here. Do something I forgot to teach. I forgot to teach in my other class, too. Uh, let's go back and do that. Tensor fasciolata. The muscle is named for its action. A muscle that tenses. This muscle tenses a lot of fascia. Fascia lana is a connective tissue. It's like Spandex for your thigh keeps everything bound together. Okay, so you don't need to buy spandex. You have spandex. It's fasciolata. <laughs> Biological spandex. And when I remove from muscle, it's like it's very tough. It's very sturdy tissue. Well, anyways, this specifically tenses the IT band. Okay. Tense IT band and provides lateral support for the knee. The origin ASIS, along with Sartorius, the insertion IT band. Already mentioned its action, tenses the IT band, and the innervation is a good test question. Okay, 
inferior, no, so superior gluteal Innervation. Innervation. Superior gluteal nerve. That's why I listed it with the gluteal muscles because of the innervation. Uh, I'm remembering now. Now, um, technically not part of the region, but the, the nerve is. And a good question for you is, you know, which three muscles are innervated by this nerve? This is one of them. What are the other two? Gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, and tensor fascia lata, all innervated by superior gluteal nerve. Okay, that's the muscle I forgot. We go back and do leg. And if you ever see something on your list, you know, check to make sure I didn't forget. Don't think, oh, he didn't teach it, now I don't have to know it. It'll end up on your test. Sometimes I leave it off because you don't have to know it. Ask me again, and I'll say, oh, yeah, you're not responsible for that. So, you know, ask to clarify. Uh, and here, okay, what's next? Well, I did posterior leg. Okay, let's go back and do lateral leg. Lateral leg. Now these muscles are in the lateral compartment. They plantar flex either either foot. Innervated by the superficial branch of the fibular nerve. Basically, two muscles. There's more than two. The, the two main ones are fibularis longus and brevis. Let's look at the lateral leg. Let me highlight it in the leg. There you go. I'm going to isolate it. This is the fibularis longus. There you go. You can see this tendon is passing posterior to the malleolus, so it's a plantar flexor. The origin is basically head of fibula. The insertion, here, here's the origin, head of fibula. The insertion, you gotta look under the foot, base of first metatarsal. It goes all the way under there. So let me put the muscle back in the picture. There it is. Isolate. Look at the insertion. The tendon goes under the foot and inserts on the base of the first metatarsal. Origin. Head of fibula. Insertion. Base of first metatarsal. All right, so the brevis is underneath it. Remember, longer muscles are going to be more superficial because they're longer, so they're on top. And the brevis, if I zoom in and I kind of hit the muscle underneath it, that's the brevis. Nice, like that. Here it is. That's the fibularis brevis all by itself. So for this one, oh, I should put the muscle I'm talking about. Fibularis, sorry. Fibularis longus. Uh, and then the, we're going to move the fibularis brevis next. Where it's long gust, I guess. same action. Okay, so I'm just going to change the attachments. The origin of this muscle is basically shaft of fibula. 
makes sense that the attached to the fibula is the lateral leg bone, and this is the lateral compartment of the leg. This one inserts base of fifth metatarsal. So I'm showing you there. Insert base of fifth metatarsal. Same action, same innervation okay, as, the, as the longest. My daughter uh, used to do gymnastics and she did, does the vault, we land, and she landed and she felt something pop. It turns out what she did was she fractured the base of the fifth metatarsal. Uh, let me go my tool. I remember looking at the. Like this. And I remember thinking, oh, okay. Probably because that, that muscle there, fibularis brevis, it attaches to it, so it just probably evolves it off. Okay. Um, so when muscles attach there and you apply a tremendous force, you can snap things. Um, is the lesson here. All right, let me get rid of that. Let's move on to anterior compartment. Pretty much right here. The main muscle here is the tibialis anterior. I'm going to highlight, highlight it there, isolate. There you go. It's the biggest muscle in this compartment, the tibialis anterior. muscles I'm teaching you, pretty much they can um, dorsiflex invert. And the innervation, the deep branch, deep fibular nerve, anterior compartment, here's tibialis anterior. I mean, pretty much, um, you know, there's a membrane between tib and fib. I haven't showed that to you yet. It's called the inner osseous membrane. show that. I mean, they don't do a good, okay, well then it's not showing it to me on the app, but no, there's a membrane between tib and fib, and I'm going to list the interosseous membrane between tib and fib as the origin for this muscle. It's to be all's posterior. There's tibialis anterior. It originates interosseous membrane and inserts on the base of the first metatarsal. Now, interosseous is a term that literally means between two bones. This membrane is between tip fib. That's 
where it originates. It has other origin, but basically that membrane inserts base of first metatarsal to dorsiflex and invert the foot. Let me show you one of those actions. I've been talking about them so much. See that? that? That's inversion. Okay. With, with the way it's pulling from the inside aspect of the foot on this uh, metatarsal, it can help invert. That's tibialis anterior. There's two other ones. Okay. The muscles are in this compartment. They're going to insert on top of the foot, the dorsal aspect of the foot. They'll be able to extend the toes. So those are the names of those muscles. The two on your study list are extensor digitorum longus, extensor hallucis longus. There's the extensor digitorum longus. I'll isolate it. And I've shown you the insertion. The distal phalanges of digits two through five. Extensor digitorum longus. There's a brevis, we're not doing it. And we did extensor digitorum for the fingers, right? Mm -hmm. This is for the toes. The origin is the same, interosseous membrane, and it inserts on, like I just showed you, right here, distal phalanges. Of digits two through five. So it can do the same things as the other one. Um, it can dorsiflex, invert the foot. It can also extend toes. So I'll add that to the list. Or digits, if you will, two to five. Okay. Digit number one has its own muscle, the extensor hallucis longus. There. Let me isolate it. So I'm zooming in on the insertion. The distal phalanges, the, the distal phalanx of digit one, the hallux. The origin, I'll just keep it the same, interosseous membrane. I mean, I'm, I'm being, I'm taking shortcuts here. I'm just trying to make it easy, right? Interosseous membrane inserts distal phalanx of the hallux, digit one. Can extend big toe. Okay, that's digit one. And that finishes leg. Let's move up to ab wall. While I do that, you know, if you have any questions, now is the time to ask for your leg. Done with leg, gotta do ab wall. That will finish the muscles. All right, so we're moving to a different region here. Just to orient you, your thinking. That's half of your abdominal region.
there it is highlighted. Um, so basically, you, you, you got to, if I were to highlight the whole thing, that's just half of the app region. There, that's, that's the app region right there. Definitely. The apps. Basically, you got a shape like this. More or less. That top mark is the xiphoid process. And note, in this kind of curvature, it, it's following the costal margin of the rib cage. Okay. Remember the costal cartilage? Mm -hmm. It's kind of following that. And then it kind of goes laterally, and then it goes down. That, that pretty much is, you know, ASIS, your, your hip bone. Um, okay, and this kind of follows the um, inguinal ligament. So that, that's basically this region. You got the umbilicus right, right in the middle there, the belly button. But we're, we're more concerned about um, the musculature. That's this unit, and we're, we're doing the muscles here. Uh, as a region, that's what we're talking about. I will remove skin. Look at the muscles there. Now, so these are sheets of muscle. So in terms of the musculature, basically the muscles of the ab wall. And think of these um, muscles, there's, there's like three sheets. And they're kind of stuck together, kind of like plywood, right? Collectively, when these three sheets of muscle contract, it's like you're increasing the pressure in your abdominal cavity. So then when they collectively contract, Increase pressure in ab cavity. So when you do that, um, well, it helps empty the rectum, like during defecation. We call it straining against a closed glottis. Your glottis is your airway, so when you strain against it, like that grunting, you know, when you do that, that's basically what you're doing. Okay. Also, like when you lift a heavy object, you grunt. You do it instinctively. You weren't like thinking, okay, I'm going to grunt. You just do it. Okay. Lift heavy object. Because when you help, you know, tense those muscles, increase the pressure, it makes the trunk more stable. It kind of makes it stronger, right? Lift heavy object helps um, strengthen trunk. I guess that also helps to absorb a blow. I think of the, the tough guy marine. It's like, come on, give me your best shot, come on. You know, that's basically one big muscle. Which is probably why I never joined the military. I wouldn't last a day there. Uh, okay, well, anyways, um, so this first muscle group is called the external oblique. Let me isolate that first layer there. 
I'm not really gonna ask you where, where these muscles attach. Look at the picture. Basically, they attach to like parts of the rib cage and the pelvis, but I'm not gonna ask you that. Okay, I mean, ID and And so these muscles, they call them the anterolateral um, wall muscles. Anterolateral abdominal wall muscles. Three layers, as I said before. This is the first one. Notice the term anterolateral. It's not completely in front, but it's kind of like front lateral kind of. This is the external oblique. And notice that how much connective tissue there is. There's a, what's called the external aponeurosis. So most books will just call it the external oblique. The, mo the complete name would be external abdominal oblique. Okay, but you, I guess you could just call it external oblique. And what might be hard to see, it doesn't project very well. For these muscle groups, look at the direction that the fibers run. So I'm gonna zoom in and kind of show you. I think that's useful information. It helps you identify it. Fibers are all kind of running down this way. Okay, uh, let me turn the lights off. You can't see that. Kind of like if you put your hands in your pockets, this kind of downward orientation. They all run that way. Okay, the external oblique. So let me, let me re isolate it again. Let me get rid of that. Clear. Is there a specific reason why they run down? Um, yeah. You know, the fibers of these three layers, they crisscross in different ways. Mm -hmm. And when fibers crisscross, it helps strengthen them as a group. Yeah. So if I were to draw that layer, uh, remember how I drew the ab like this? Like that. The fibers are kind of all running this way. And this way on this side. So those are the external. Yeah, what I drew in red are the fibers of the external oblique that run this way. And what's in the middle, all this connective tissue, is called the uh, aponeurosis of the external oblique. It's basically connective tissue. Okay. And the aponeurosis, they kind of zipper together at the midline. And a structure called the linea alba. or white line. So in my picture, aponeurosis, CT, lat anterolaterally, you got the muscle fibers of the external oblique, which zipper, to, zipper together at your midline, the linea alba. It's, it's called, they call it a raffe. So let's describe. Like, like a seam, where your clothes stitch together. That's a seam. Let me show you the linea alba. What's highlighted in white 
is the linea alba. Okay, so that's the external oblique. Let's talk about muscle actions. I'll give you one here. This is lateral flexion of the trunk when you bend to the same side. side, the muscle that's contracting, you bend to that side, it's lateral flexion of the trunk. Here's trunk rotation. You rotate trunk to the opposite side. This, I'm turning to the left. You, you rotate to the other side. You can just flex the trunk too if they both work together. Trunk flexion. That's if they're both working together. You can flex the trunk. Just bend forward. Okay, they call that bilateral action because both of them have to be working at the same time to flex the trunk. I'll just say flex trunk. Okay. So any questions about this muscle? I'm going to do the one deep to it. It's like a three-ply muscle layer. Let's remove external oblique to see the internal oblique. There we go. There's internal oblique underneath it. It shouldn't be hard to remember which one's more superficial if they call them external and internal, right? I'm going to leave everything the same in terms of my picture, except the fibers run differently. They kind of fan out. They don't all run down like this. I'm going to erase the direction of the fibers. They're different. That, that's a clue, too. If you look at the fibers, when you look at this, the, some of these fibers are running up. But then as you go down, they kind of, now they're transverse. And then when you get down here, they run down. So it's like they, they kind of fan out. So the fibers maybe run like more or less like that. We're not all oriented in the same way. The internal oblique. They still have the linea alba. They all zipper up at the linea alba. Oh, God, can't spell. Internal oblique. And they all have the same action, so I'll just kind of leave these there. All right? A big sheet of muscle. The internal oblique. One thing I've been drawing the ab like this, I know you don't think about these things, but the abdominal region is kind of strange. It's like in front, the abdominal region is much wider. When you get to the side and you follow the rib cage down, the abdominal region is very short. It's only the distance between the bottom of your rib cage and the top of your hip bone. It's only like this big. But in the front, it's pretty wide. Well, that's why I keep drawing it like this. The deepest layer inside the internal oblique is transversus abdominis. So I'm going to remove more layers right there. Okay, That's transversus, abdominis, named so because of the direction of the fibers. They're all perfectly in the transverse plane. So 
for those fibers, I'll just kind of draw them straight up and down. I mean, not straight up and down, straight across, sorry. And the transverse plane, pretty much straight across. Okay, so that's the deepest layer. That's the transversus abdominis. Again, now the aponeurosis of this muscle group has a little pocket. See that little pocket? Let me, show, let me go back and show you in the full get out of there. That pocket is for the rectus abdominis. Let me, let me hide that momentarily. I'm going to remove rectus abdominis on one side. So transverse abdominis, one thing I would note is this rectus sheath, which is like a, a pocket for um, the rectus abdominis. Yeah, it's superficial to the aponeurosis of this, and I'll teach it next. All right, so transversus abdominis. The aponeurosis contains the rectus sheath. has a fourth muscle, the rectus abdominis. You know, your six pack, your abs, when people work out their abs, they just think about rectus abdominis, but it's way more than just rectus abdominis. Isolated. So there's half of rectus abdominis. It's unique. It's this muscle. You can say it's it's the anterior abdominal wall. It's not anterior lateral. It's anterior medial. Right. It's it's right in the middle. Let me erase all of this. So this muscle, it has the distinction of being the only segmented muscle. The quote unquote six pack. It's segmented because of these tendinous intersections between the muscle groups. So note the tendinous intersections, hence the packs. That's why you have packs, because the intersections. When the muscle contracts, you see the packs, or not. <laughs> we all have six packs, and some of us, you can't see it like me. It's there, and every time I do a dissection, now everyone has a six pack, it doesn't matter if you have fat covering it. Now technically, it's an eight pack, isn't it? Now the top pack is attaching to ribs. When you attach to the stiff ribs, you really can't contract and see it. So you only see the six, green three, okay? Some people you can. I'm sure you can Google it and you can see, yeah. Well, anyways, this muscle is, um, it lies in the rectus sheath. See how it kind of disappears in the rectus sheath there? This is the transversus abdominis. And that's important because when this muscle helps flex the trunk, it would pop out if it weren't held down by this rectus sheath. Mm. Okay, they call it bow stringing in your book. Um, the rectus sheath.
movement, this muscle from bow stringing or protruding out. during trunk flexion. And that's his main action there. Okay, so that's rectus abdominis. Uh, that's pretty much all I have to say about that. <coughs> okay, what I wanted to do now, um, I wanted to show you the, the neuropathies I wanted you to know for the exam. And I had a PowerPoint called Clinical Problems on Canvas. I want to download that and show you some of those neuropathies, or at least the ones you have to know. Give me a second to pull that up. Come in the canvas side, just look for that thing I was telling you about. Clinical problems. Clicking that there. And clicking to show you that it is there. I'm just going to download this. Okay, know the anterior, a positive test for the anterior drawer sign. It's a test of the. Uh, ACL. Let's watch this on YouTube. The examiner sits on the foot and pulls anteriorly on the tibia. And again, as the ACL is completely torn here, there's nothing to check movement in this direction. The tibia distracts anteriorly far more than it would if the uh, ACL was intact. I can also see that with the anterior drawer test. Um, again, have the patient sit, I'm sitting on the foot, I pull forward. I can feel that there's more anterior translocation. And when I perform the anterior drawer test, there is not as much anterior translocation. Side. Just watch that closely, it's very subtle. What is he doing? He's pulling on the leg. Uh, so let me write that on the board. <coughs> what he was doing is pulling forward, pull, pulling towards himself to test the integrity of the ACL. Yeah. Yeah, they kind of hug the leg. Yeah, yeah. So watch, watch that one again, or watch other ones that might be better, so you can kind of see that for yourself. And if I know that, basically, the anterior jar test. What is that a test for? Test um, for an ACL rupture or tear. Okay, so a positive test means it might be ruptured if you can kind of pull the leg more forward than you should. Um, the next one, I think it's uh, the Trendelenburg gait or the uh, small gluteal weakness. Yeah, this gait, if you have, um, for whatever reason, 
the nerve to the small gluteal muscles, medius and minimus, doesn't work so well. If it doesn't stabilize the pelvis, when this foot, during the swing leg, during the walking, the swing leg, when it's off the ground, the pelvis will sag. Okay. So um, look for that in this clip. Just gonna film you walk if that's okay, just for educational purposes. No, no, it's good. Yeah. You see the sag? Yeah. I see it. Watch that one more time. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the gluteus medius and, and minimus is the one. So what I thought was kind of funny about that is, um, well, let's watch it one more time. Look, look what side the cane is on. And look what side is sagging. No, no, it's good. The cane is on this. The wrong side, in my opinion. Right. Yeah, what the heck? Well, think about it from the patient. What muscles are weak? The muscles on this side are weak, causing this side to sag. Okay? So she feels weakness here. She thinks she needs support for the weak side, but it's the other side that's sagging. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> oh, like the you can look like a Okay, this one's foot drop. This is where that deep fibular nerve is paralyzed and the muscles of the anterior leg are paralyzed. So they cannot extend the foot when you walk. So you're, 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 um, you have foot drop. So what you do to compensate is you have this high steppage gait. Where you, it, uh, this doesn't really show it well. You're gonna swing the leg high because your foot's dragging because you can't, ex you can't dorsiflex. So you can't dorsiflex, you have foot drop. Before we talked about wrist drop, right? <laughs> because you had um, the radial nerve paralyzed. And when, here's, a, here's a, watch this guy. Yeah, like. Okay, get the thing right. The right one has foot drop, so he kind of has to compensate for that. Okay. So that's that one. You want to create a stunning website? Yeah, yeah. I've already done it. So, so look at um, all that stuff. It's on the PowerPoint. Let me get out of here. I think I spelled that right. This is the pelvis sag one. So this was weakness of what muscles? The small gluteal muscles, which are gluteus, medius, and minimus. So what nerve innervates those two muscles? The superior or the inferior one? The superior gluteal nerve, somehow that's damaged.
So if those muscles are weak, this causes the pelvis to sag. So these weakened gluteal muscles cause pelvis sag. And the thing that you learn from the video is you sag on the side opposite, not the same side. Okay. Um, then that third one we watched was foot drop with high steppage gait. So that was the anterior muscles. Okay, those extensors, those dorsiflexors, they're paralyzed. So that nerve is the deep fibular nerve. I'll say that's damaged. So dorsiflexors, like tibialis anterior, they're paralyzed. causing foot drop. So the high steppage gait compensates for the foot drop. And that's what the that's what you saw in the video clip I showed you. Okay? I thought it was the radial nerve. That's for upper extremity. Yeah. All right. You know that concludes the material for um, lower extremity. I said that um, your test is going to be on proctorial. Um, on the schedule, it should be listed for Monday. Is that correct? Yes. So you're not going to the posterior abdominal? Posterior abdominal. Oh, oh, yeah, I forgot one muscle. Thank you. Good thing I told you to remind me about stuff I can get. The one muscle that should be done. The posterior abdominal wall right here. Iliopsoas. Let me go back. So the posterior abdominal wall is four muscles. The only one on your list is two muscles. The iliopsoas, which is two muscles in one. Posterior abdominal wall. is silent. The iliopsoas muscle is actually two muscles that share one tendon. I have one of the, uh, those two muscles shown here. The iliopsoas is actually psoas major and iliacus. So as major shown here, originates on the transverse processes of T12 um, all the way down. <clears throat> T12 to L5. tendon will actually insert on the lesser trochanter. Don't worry about innervation. I don't ask that for this muscle. 
part of it's femoral, part of it's something else. It's a little confusing. Just forget about that. But do know it's action. This iliopsoas muscle is your major hip flexor. Okay. The other muscle is the iliacus. That's so as major. So put them back together. So what's highlighted is so as major. There's a so as minor, don't worry about it. So as major is the one you gotta know. There's iliacus. Okay, let me isolate it. See how it's originating in the iliac fossa? of the hip bone, hence the name iliacus, originates iliac fossa, inserts, well, same place, it shares the tendon, I'll just list it again, that's your trochanter. So that's the posterior abdominal wall. So those other ones I taught are the anterior abdominal wall, basically. Okay. Action's the same. Action's the same. Hip flexor. But is it a major hip flexor? Yeah. 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 Ileal size is your major hip flexor. Major. Okay. I'm going to look at the list make sure I didn't forget anything. It's pretty well covered. Okay, so um, you have um, your lecture exam six. That will be on Proctorio. What day is it today? available Monday. Uh, I'll give you an extra day. I'll make it Monday to Tuesday. Uh, I'll probably toy. I'll give you an extra day there. Um, let's see here. No. So the dates. Today is the 11th. Yes. So this is the 16th and the 17th. Check your calendar. That's next week. When's your lab practical for lower extremity? Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. Okay, so the 23rd, that's a Monday. So that's when you got to be ready. When we come back Monday, I'm starting the next unit. So this is the part of the course where you have to juggle. I'm moving on because I'm done. Okay? If your tests are these dates. You kind of have to like keep up with what I'm covering and be ready for your tests on those dates. Okay, yeah, question? Um, for the Monday, the lab practical, does class start at regular time or at 10 a.m. again? I'll, I'll do it the same way I did the last time. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, uh, any, oh, yeah. If I have it ready over the weekend, I'll make it available. I don't know yet. I'm still working on it. All right. So no more questions. I'll dismiss you. Feel free to stick around to study with one little time remains.